Thanks for joining us again for session five of Why Do I Need the Church? You know, we've talked each week about different ways we need the church and how it's good for us and it's good for us to be a part of it. Well, this week we're going to be looking at why we need the church is because we strengthen one another. Now, I have a little weight here, and it's not going to do a whole lot of good to, to strengthen, but this, this weight represents something that you can use to grow and to become stronger. If I exercise with it, my muscles will grow. And if you were to go do large weightlifting and lift the, the big weights, you would need someone there with you. You know, they go into the gyms and they're pushing two and three and four hundred pounds sometimes. There are other people there right beside them, and they call those people spotters. They're there to make sure if something happens, if they can't get the bar back up, they're there to help them carry that weight. You know, we all need someone there with us to help us when we can't carry the whole load ourselves. The church is there to help us do that. And the truth is, we strengthen one another to live in the way God wants us to live when we come together as a church. Now, in Ephesians, Paul lays out a practical application of the theological truths that he had talked about in the first three chapters of the book. In chapter 5, we start to see how we are connected to the larger society. And we need to understand how we as Christians relate to the rest of the world. You know, people have always tried to convince Christians that we can pursue Jesus and still sin and live like the rest of the world does. But there's absolutely no truth in that. To follow Christ means we put away sin. We live the life God has called us to live. And the church is there to help us do that, to strengthen us. So we're going to be looking at, we need the church today because it helps strengthen us and helps us live the life God has called us to live. Let's look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 8. For you were once darkness. Now, Paul has preceded these verses with exhortations on types of sins to avoid. He specifically mentions sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness. All those are interrelated in a lot of ways. And he says our speech should be pure and, and not marked by these kind of things and the talk that's unbecoming a believer. So he says, you were once in darkness, and he described the way we were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We can help each other as believers stand against the sinful ways of the world. We can help strengthen one another to make that, take that stand. You notice Paul in the first verses did not say we were in darkness and are now in light. Paul said, look carefully, he said, we were darkness and now are light. It's not just that we were in a place of darkness, but we were actual darkness. It's not that now we brought close to light and we're now illuminated. No, we are light because Christ lives within us. Our, our nature has changed. We are different. That is why we have to fight the sin in our life, because it is contrary to who we are. Not just it's bad for the location we're in or our condition, but because of who we are, we are changed. And sin is completely contrary to our nature now. We were dark by nature. We were sinful by nature. But when Christ came in, our nature is now one of light. We are told to walk as children of light. And that he gives us a clear way to do that then. He says, Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Do what pleases God. Obey Him. And the, do the things that are good, that are right, that are true. Now that's a simple formula to do a difficult task. But He doesn't leave us alone. It's one of the reasons we need the church, because they help us to do what is good, what is right, what is true, and to seek what is pleasing to the Lord. It also requires us to not participate in the works of darkness. Things such as sexual immorality, greed, 
filthy or vulgar speech. All those things that have no business in the part or being a part of the life of a Christian. It says not only do we not do those things, but instead we are also to actively expose them. We're to reveal where those things are. Now, this isn't saying we're to go and call people out when they have these sins in our lives, but we, the way we live in the world casts light on the darkness that is there. And those who are, have gone astray, who have left the teaching of the word, who have left God, when, when the light comes around them, it exposes that. And our hope is, and the hope of Scripture here is that they will then be convinced to return to their senses, to return to following God. You see, it's not that we're just to be over here calling names and naming sins to everybody, but we're to live as light in the world, and the light reveals the darkness that is around, and it exposes that. If you were to go into a room where the lights were turned off and it's full of furniture, you try stumbling in and walking through the room with no light on, you, you might have a hard time crossing the room. But you turn the lights on and you can clearly see what is there and what are the obstacles. Now, the light didn't make the furniture or the things in the room appear and the darkness didn't make them disappear or cause them to be there. They were there. The light just revealed it. So when we live as children of the light, when we walk that way in the world, we reveal the sin by the way we live our lives, by doing the things that are good, that are right, and that are true, and echoing and reflecting Christ in our lives. So we are not to participate in the works of darkness, but then to expose them. And so why don't we do these kind of things that Paul said, don't be a part of these? Why don't do them? Well, because he says they're even things that are shameful to speak about. The things that are done in secret, we should be even ashamed to, to speak them. Not only to do them, but to even speak about them. If it is shameful to speak about these things, imagine how much more offensive they are to God when we as believers participate in them. We are expo to expose darkness to light. Because the light of Christ has the power to expose the sin, to bring it to light, and to bring healing and forgiveness to those things. The hope in this is that sinners can be transformed because of the light that's found in Christ. And Paul closes this segment with what some have said may be an early Christian hymn. Maybe Paul wrote it himself. And it reflects with the truths of Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. And he says this, two parallel lines. Paul says, get up, sleeper, and then rise up from the dead. Hey, you are, that are sleeping, that are unaware, that aren't paying attention to what's going on, get up. Deal with this sin. Don't just ignore it. Rise up from the dead. Leave your sin. Leave this. And then a promise ends the phrase. Christ, the light of the world, will shine on you. Christ is the one who will come that will cause us to put away sin, that has the power to forgive sin. So get up, sleeper. Rise up from the dead. We have an obligation as believers in the church to help each other stand against sin that is so easily coming at us in this world. You need the church. I need the church. We need each other to help us stand against sin that so easily traps us and tricks us and takes us the wrong way. That's why we need the church. We do this because it's a battle that there's two different ways. We have a battle of temptations that come from the inside from our own hearts. We have sin. The, the, the holiness is in two different ways. And this, this battle is from our own thoughts and our own actions and our own thinking inside. We have those temptations and we need help to overcome those. And also we, we face temptations from the outside, from the sinful world that come at us. And, and like these barbells, the, the weights of this world seem to keep coming at us from all directions and they are weighing heavily on us. But with the Holy Spirit and the spotters of brothers and sisters in the faith around us, we can withstand the opposition that comes our way. You see, in America, our individualism lies to us and tells us that we can do this alone. We're so prideful, we think, I've got this. I don't need anybody's help. I'm strong enough without someone else. It's just not true. 
God did not create us to withstand sin and live the life God has called us to live alone. We can't do it. We need one another. We need the spiritual support of the Holy Spirit who dwells us and empowers us. And we need the body of Christ to help us. That is the church. Paul continues. Let's see what he says. He says, now, pay careful attention. Focus on it. Look at it. Don't ignore it. To how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In the church, we have the ability to help one another make wise use of our time. There's two things we need to do here. We need to walk with wisdom and walk with understanding. He, he says walk as wise, not as unwise. We, we first do this through making wise use of our time. We, we're not just trying to avoid evil but we're positively seeking to use the gifts and the graces that God has given us in ways that further the kingdom. You remember when Moses prayed, it's echoed in Psalm number 90, that God would teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. You see, the amount of time we have is not nearly as important as what we do with the time we do have. And the truth is we probably all have places in our lives or days where we could better leverage our time and our gifts for the kingdom. There's something we can add, there's something we can remove, or there's something we can change that will allow us to make better use of our time to serve God. So we walk with wisdom and we also walk with understanding. So he's saying don't be foolish. We're reminded of the, the Proverbs specifically where it says to seek wisdom. Don't live like the fool. You see, the rewards of wisdom and and not responding as those who have no understandings, it's it's a great reward. There's promises that will be filled in this life and the life to come. We need to be seeking wisdom and, and understanding what God's purpose in the world is. He says do this by being pleasing to him. How do we know what to do? How do we have understanding? Obey God. Know what pleases Christ. That was what it means to understand the Lord's will. Paul continues. He says, And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. We see here as we walk in the Spirit that we strengthen one another as we're filled with the Spirit and live in mutual submission. Now Paul uses the, uh, the picture here of drunkenness to, to, to describe what he's wanting to us to understand. Now, drunkenness in the pagan world was at times even part of their worship of false gods. So why do we avoid the drunkenness? Well, because it leads to reckless living. It's a behavior which shows a lack of concern or thought for the consequences of our actions. Drunkenness leaves us where we don't have full control of our senses, of our understanding, of our thinking. He says, don't be drunk as the world would have you to be drunk. And so he uses this picture to set up being contrasted with, instead of being drunk as the world would have you to be drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk by means of wine, but be filled by means of the Spirit, with the truths of the living God. There are four results, he says here, of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We then will address one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We see here a horizontal dimension of our singing and our our praise. When we sing together, it's an encouragement. That's one reason it's not just enough to watch TV or or watch worship at home all the time. In a non-pandemic time, we would have never thought that'd be the primary way most of the church would be worshiping. But that's not how we're designed to worship because it's part of the the call and the the working of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives that we are around other believers worshiping. And that we sing psalms and hymns and, and we worship God. It's an encouragement to others when they hear us singing. We see others who are there beside us in the fight with us, in the battle. And we know we're not alone. So we we address others and we see that horizontal nature and we encourage one another. 
And then he says, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. So it's the same action as number one, singing. But now we see the vertical nature of it, our relationship to God, our worship of God, and how it benefits the church when we are worshiping God together. Then he says, we are giving thanks. And he says, we give thanks in four ways. Well, we say, we give thanks always. It means we consistently do it. There's not a time when we are an unthankful people for whatever God has given us. We understand that everything we have comes from God. We also give thanks for everything in all things. In every circumstance, we are continually giving thanks. And it says we give thanks to God the Father, who's the creator and the sustainer of all. He's the one that is the one who gives us what we are thankful for. And how does he give it to us? Number four, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one by whose authority we are praying. So we are constantly in everything, giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. And then another result of being filled with the Holy Spirit is submitting to one another. Why? Because we reverence Christ. As we submit to one another, we are also submitting to Christ. We think of others more highly than ourselves. We look out for the good of others. When we do that, it encourages others. It strengthens them. I am strengthened by your obedience to Christ. You are strengthened by my obedience to Christ. And we strengthen one another to live as God desires. You see, Paul laid out these practical applications. He had laid out the theological truths of salvation, of of sin, and the forgiveness. And he says, because of that, here's how we live. You see, in the church, we encourage one another to live that strong life. Apart from the church, we will never gain the the spiritual strength we need. We will not be able to withstand sin the way we need to. It's coming at us. It's a battle. It's a fight. We need others around us to help us. We need those spiritual spotters who will catch the weight when it's too much for us to carry. And maybe you've not been to that point in your life yet where you think, well, I can do it. I don't need that. Just wait. There is a day that will come when the onslaught of sin, the discouragement of this world, the pain of this world will be too much for you to bear alone. And the truth is, God never designed for you to bear it alone. He has determined and He has decided that we should do that in the context of a church with other believers. And when we are together, when we are committed to the church, when we do our part, we encourage one another and we strengthen one another when we are here together. We strengthen each other in our fight against sin. We strengthen each other in our worship and how we live, and we push each other to do what God has called each of us to do. So now the question is, will you answer the call? Will you be here when you need encouragement and then... Will you be there when there's someone else who's struggling under those weights? Whatever life brings at them, they need someone to help them lift it. Will you be there to encourage them and strengthen them and help them? Or you will just leave them there struggling on their own. See, the church is here for each of us to help one another and to strengthen one another. So will you be there when those in the church need you? God bless you.